I was reviewing where we were this morning before I had to take off to go back home. And uh, I know we're down to verse 15, Hebrews chapter 13. Last time we talked about primarily verses 10 through 14 about, uh, about uh, going unto Christ outside the camp and uh, the need to separate from the temple and from the sacrifices because uh, they have a sacrifice that, uh, that those who are part of the temple have no right to, and that is that, that what we have now and the Hebrew people there have now is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And those participating in temple worship have no right to Jesus Christ. You have to leave that and come to Christ outside the camp to have the right to, uh, to have the uh, application of salvation through Jesus Christ, uh, which is a real reminder that even in the dispensation of grace, that you have to come to God through his grace in order to be saved. You can't carry along your works and say, well, I'll have my works and I'll also carry along my, uh, I'll also trust God's grace to save. Uh, by virtue of the fact that you're, you're coming to God and offering some of your works, you are nullifying grace. And uh, so it's one or the other. And in order to be saved, you must recognize that your works can't save you, but God's grace can. And then when you make that decision and, and trust just in the grace of God, then God gives you everlasting life. Uh, but we're down here to uh, verse 15, where it says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that, that is, the fruit of our, uh, of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now, aren't you glad we had some prayer time and a lot of thanksgiving before we read that verse? Uh, the nation of Israel, you know, you're talking about sacrifices here and how they're going to go to, they're not going to be part of the temple sacrifices in that priesthood. They're going to come to Christ outside the camp. And then in, la in, in the same language of, of sacrifices, it says in verse 15, by him, by Jesus Christ, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. So it's not the sacrifice of an animal, but to offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Uh, that is, and he explains what the sacrifice is, just to make sure there's no confusion and someone doesn't run back to the animal sacrifices. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. That is the sacrifice that they can offer. And that is a sacrifice that the nation of Israel... Uh, was always to offer to God when there was no temple. Now, right now they had a temple, but there is a time when they would not have a temple, even in the Old Testament. Come back to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 6. Now, I, I jotted down quite a few verses here, and I... Uh, well, anyhow, we'll just have to look at them together. I, I don't remember each particular verse when I made these notes, I, I remember looking at these and realizing how often, especially when you go through the Psalms, is Israel told to give a sacrifice of praise. Uh, it, but it comes from this. Solomon is writing and he's telling what to do. Uh, he, he's asking God uh, to remember the nation of Israel. And even when Israel fails him and he has to chasten the nation of Israel, uh, what the nation of Israel must do during the time of their chastening. Now know this, that this, this is Solomon, and it's quite a few years later that the nation of Israel will finally have turned from God to such a point that he will drive them off the land into the hands of uh, the, the, the Babylonian, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, carried off to Babylon, the Babylonian captivity. And uh, in light of what Solomon had taught the nation of Israel, what they ought to do when they're carried away. Babylon, when it came into the land, destroyed the temple. So there's no more offering of sacrifice for 70 years when they were into captivity. Not until they returned under uh, Zerubbabel did they rebuild the temple and offer a sacrifice again. 70 years they could not offer a sacrifice because there was no temple to do it. Under Solomon's instructions, it says in verse 36, If they, the nation of Israel, sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them, uh, deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captive into a land far off or near. Yet if 
they bethink themselves in the land whether they are carried away captive and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul uh, in the land of their captivity, whether they be carried from, uh, whether they have carried them captive and pray toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers and toward the city, which thou hast chosen and toward the house, which I have built for thy, uh, thy name. Then hear thou from heaven, even from thy dwelling place, their prayer and their supplications, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people which, uh, which have sinned against thee. So if they're carried away, what Solomon is asking God to do, and by the way, when it says in verse 36, if they sin against thee, well, apparently Solomon knew, there's, of course they're going to do this, uh, because look at the parentheses. For there is no man uh, which sinneth not. So the nation of Israel is going to sin. And, and then they're going to be carried away into another land. And, and then the instructions down there in verse, uh, uh, verse uh, the end of verse 38, is that they are to pray toward the land that, they, that God gave to their fathers, toward the city, that's Jerusalem, and toward the house, the temple. So wherever they're at, they're going to turn and locate where the temple would have been located in Jerusalem and pray in that direction, and God's going to hear from heaven. And, and, then, and then Solomon is asking that if, if they would confess their sins, that God would forgive them their sins. And that's how God dealt with the nation of Israel. Now, hold your place there and come to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. No, it's Daniel chapter 6. There's another place where he prays in 9, but chapter 6. This is where he's going to get thrown in the lion's den, if I'm right. And uh, Daniel chapter 6, it says in verse 10. He's not allowed to pray, but he's going to do it anyhow. So it says, uh, that is, a human king says he can't pray to anyone, but God says he should. So he does it, and he doesn't do it underground. He does it openly. But look what he does. In Daniel 6, verse 10, it says, Now when, Dan now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into the house... And uh, his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeling down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Well, you know, they used to have sacrifices, morning sacrifice, evening sacrifice. That's what they did when they had a temple. When you're carried away from the land and Israel cannot have, does not have a temple, what they were instructed to do is to pray toward that land, toward that temple, where the sacrifices would be going on. And when Daniel prays toward that, he, he, he gives thanks, as it says, before God, as he did aforetime. That is, before the, the decree that he could not pray to any god, he could only ask the king a petition. Uh, he just continually asked God like he did before, and that's when he's arrested, thrown in the lion's den, and, and God shut the mouth of the lions and preserved Daniel's life. But... Uh, but, but Daniel here is, uh, is doing just what it said that Solomon said that they should do, is to turn and pray toward the temple, and you can see him offering up the sacrifice of thanksgiving. When Israel didn't have a temple, that's what they, that's what they are instructed to do, is to turn and pray toward Jerusalem and offer thanksgiving. Here, look what David did. Look to Psalms 51. When David had sinned, and there is no sacrifice you could offer for the sins that David did, and uh, David acknowledges that, but he does what God wants even above sacrifice. Psalms 51. And, and look at verse uh, 15. It says, uh, O Lord, open thou my lips, and uh, my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not, uh, delighteth not in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God, the sacrifices of God, are a broken spirit, uh, is a, is, are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou, uh, wilt not despise. Um, and, and so David, in, in the things that he did and, and, and what he sinned, he, he says, open my mouth and I'll praise you. 
uh, I give a sacrifice if that's what you want, but that's not what you want. In the sins that he did, there is no sacrifice that he could offer to God. And in the sins that he did is, a, is the, the sin of adultery and then tried to cover it up by having a man killed, so making him guilty of murder. And, uh, and those things David could not offer any sacrifice for. But he did have the, the, the contrite uh, heart. He did have the broken spirit. Uh, he had the willingness to praise God, and he could praise God because the prophet told him that God has put away his sins. And certainly the law did not put away uh, David's sins. It was the cross of Christ, uh, 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 put away in the sense that God is looking forward to a time in which he'll deal with that sin later, and he'll deal with it on the cross of Christ and forgive David and offer David salvation. And, uh, and so David is offering God praise. Um, how about you read some? Let me give, I want three readers. I'm not sure the references. Uh, Russ, take Jeremiah 33:11, Jim, Psalms 40, verses 5 through 8. And one more. Rick, uh, Psalms 107, verses 21 and 22. Now, let's, let's just, uh, Jeremiah 33, 11. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever, and the done that shall bring us back. Okay. Talking about, uh, a time in which God will turn away the captivity, but the sacrifice of praise. The very same thing Hebrews is telling them to offer. Jim Psalms 40, verses 5 through 8. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to upward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou dost not desire. Mine eyes hast thou opened. Burn offering and sin offering that shall not require. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Okay, and that's when the Lord is coming to fulfill the sacrifice of a payment for sin. But, uh, you know, sometimes you think that, and, and in the Old Testament, they just got routinely offering sacrifice without ever thought of what they're doing. And here the, the Lord is, is instructing that there is more thought to the sacrifices than what people were uh, giving heed to, that God desires that someone think about what God has done and, and offer to him praise and thanksgiving for what he has done rather than just say, okay, here's a sacrifice and, then, and move on. Uh, and, and that, especially by the end of the Old Testament, when you read Isaiah chapter 1, God says, I'm just sick of your sacrifices. I mean, it, it was still under the law when those things are still required, and God couldn't even stand. He said, away with it, because of the attitude of the people. There has to be a thought, uh, a spirit behind the sacrifices, and, and when there's not, it's even, even when sacrifices were offered to God, it was not acceptable to God unless the thought was there. Uh, and then Psalms, what did I have for? Uh, 107, 21, and 22. Okay, so at least you can hear from these other verses that what Hebrews is saying is not new to the book of Hebrews. It was always God's desire that his people understand his salvation, his, his goodness to them, and offer that from their lips, not just a, a burnt offering to him, to offer from their lips a sacrifice that's pleasing to him, uh, a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. When you, when you think about what Hebrews is saying here, it's talking about praise, it's talking about thanksgiving. Uh, in fact, verse 16, it says, uh, back to Hebrews 13, in verse 16, it adds, but to do good, uh, that, that was involved in it. And then the, the other thing, uh, um, yeah, oh, and to communicate. I just read the verse. <laughs> verse 15 and 16 again. By him, therefore, let us offer unto, uh, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So there's praise and thanksgiving, but to do good and to communicate. The word communicate means not just to communicate with lips. It means to share uh, and not verbally. Most of the time, communicate in your Bible has to do with supporting, uh, giving, uh, communicate financially. And, uh, and so it says, 
uh, and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. And uh, when you think about those four things, those four things are really the proper response to grace. Uh, grace, the only response that you can do to God is say thank you. He's already done it all. So, we, so, so to praise him and to give thanks. And then what is the proper response of grace? It says, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, what? Unto good works. The, the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. The proper response to grace is praise to God, thanksgiving to God, doing good because it pleases God for us to do good, and then to communicate. The giving is just the, the very word grace itself uh, implanted in our life. Those are things that are a product of grace, and certainly it sits here in the book of Hebrews as a result of going to Christ and outside the camp because he became the sacrifice for sin. So now what's left for us to do but to praise him and to uh, thank him and to do good and to communicate, uh, to share in his grace. And uh, with those sacrifices, God is well pleased. Verse 17 says, Obey them which have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls uh, as they that ha uh, that they that as they that must give account, that they uh, may do, do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Uh, so he says here to obey them that have rule. Notice the difference between this and verse 7. In verse 7 it says, remember them which have the rule over you. And back there it's remember them. Remember what they taught. Remember who they are. Remember your apostle, so to speak. And uh, that so it's, it has to do with remembering who and what they've taught. Down here in verse 17, it's not just remembering who and what they taught. In verse 17 here, it's obey them that have the rule over you. So you, you know who your apostle is and what your, your doctrine is by them. And so you, you know them and you know the, the word that they taught you. Well, th that's not the end of the matter. Down in verse 17, now it's saying obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they have, uh, for they watch for your souls. And we've talked about how there is those apostles that we're to remember, they're to remember, especially as we read it in James and in Peter, where there's a reminder of who their apostle is and, and, and the things that they've taught. Well, now there's a reminder to obey them and, and then, and then the reminder too that they watch over your soul. But, but not only do they watch for your soul, it says they watch for your soul as they that must give account. That those rulers, they have a responsibility to teach the word to the people, and these people have a responsibility to obey and submit themselves to those rulers. But with the rulers, with that extra authority that they have, is an extra accountability. They're going to have to give an account. Their, their job is to watch over the souls, but they're going to have to give an account. You remember what, without turning there, if I say Matthew 23, now that should ring a bell in your mind what that chapter is about. And then verse 14. you have any idea what that verse is about? Okay, I'll ask you again in a minute. Come to James. Now, some of the Wednesday group, uh, Tuesday group, I mean, since we've been going through Matthew uh, almost as a refresher course from when we studied it, uh, maybe you could think about what Matthew 23 is about and come up with the verses that I'm going to ask for. But, but in James, oh, chapter 3, I didn't go there. James says this. This always scares me. <laughs> um, in verse 1, it says, My brethren, be, uh, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle his whole body. And that is, he knows how to put his words in such a way that it's, uh, it'll be beneficial to people rather than offensive to people. And when you can control your tongue, you can control your whole body. So the perfection there that he's talking about is the perfect man, the one who's able to control his tongue. But, but the first part of that verse, it says, my brethren, be not many masters. Well, the master here is like, uh, 
they, Bible days, they called their teachers master. And you know, that's how they address Jesus Christ all the time, master. And, uh, and, and still in Oriental, the teacher is called master. Uh, it says, my brethren, be not many masters. That is, don't be many teachers. Knowing that we, so apparently James is one of those teachers he's referring to. He includes himself as one of those teachers. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. There's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a time of accountability. And James himself is saying we're going to have the greater condemnation. Now it doesn't mean that he's going to be condemned above everybody else. It's just that he's going to give more account than everybody else. A student will not give it as much count as the teacher will. And uh, when, I, when I read verses like that, I, I shake. Uh, you know, some, sometimes we talk about, oh, the judgment seat of Christ, and someone thinks, oh, you teach, so you're, you're going to get something better. And I read that verse, and I say, you haven't read the verse I've read. <laughs> if I would have shut my mouth and sat in the pew, I'd probably do better. Uh, just realizing how important it is to bridle the tongue and say what God said and nothing else. Uh, and to say it in such a way that the, your, that the Holy Spirit has control of your tongue when you teach. Uh, because without that, there's a greater condemnation. And James, he put the we in there. So this is not just all bad teachers. Uh, th that's a responsibility. Anybody think of the verse in Matthew 23:14? No, I don't. Well, I don't. Well, hold on. Come to Peter. I didn't ask you to go look at it. <laughs> First Peter. First Peter chapter 5. Um, and uh, it says, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, it says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who, also, uh, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. So there's the rulers who are over the people. And it says, Not by constraint. Well, they were supposed to do it willingly, according to uh, Hebrews 13, uh, verse 17. No, stay there. I'm going to read Hebrews 13, 17 again. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they uh, watch over your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for, it is, uh, uh, for that is unprofitable for you. So they're supposed to do it with joy, and so they're to take the oversight not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, they're not going to do it for money, uh, but of a ready mind. Neither be lord, being lords over God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. Not ruling, but leading. Uh, that's what a shepherd does, he leads. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. There's a reward for a teacher here. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the old elder, uh, yea, all of you being subject, uh, subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. So, when he talks about the teachers, he talks about a reward in light of the teachers. Now, do you remember what Matthew 23 is about? Matthew 24, he's going to go away. He, it's a miniature revelation. Matthew 23 is the rebuke to the Pharisees. It's the, it's the chapter where he keeps calling them hypocrites, you hypocrites, and he keeps going through. Do you, any, do you remember what he told the Pharisees? Kathleen, read us the verse. Uh, yes, that's not, are, you, are you reading 14? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, they were the leaders in Israel at the time, but they're the apostate. They're not the ones who Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, tells them to obey. Now, Hebrews 13, 7 is the one who taught them the word of God. But the false teachers among the nation of Israel, Jesus Christ said they're going to suffer the greater damnation for standing up and teaching and preventing people from even being saved. So uh, someone who's a false teacher is going to receive a greater damnation and even a right teacher, like James, is going to have a greater judgment because of that responsibility of teaching. So he's got, a, he's got a quite a responsibility. And Peter tells him not to do it, to do it willingly and not by constraint and, and to do it not for money's sake. Uh, and if he does it with the right spirit, there's a reward for the teacher. 
But Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, now watch, look at that verse. So, so there's the teacher. It says, uh, as they that must give an account. So those teachers are going to give an account. There's a reminder. So a, a student's responsibility are those who are under the right teacher. The right teacher being verse 7, where it says, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. You've checked out the teacher. He's a true teacher of the word of God. Now, verse 17, you're to, you're to obey and submit yourself to that teacher. His responsibility is to oversee, and he's got to give an account to God. Your responsibility, or their responsibility as students, would be to obey and to submit. Now, in that verse 17, notice it says, that they may do it with joy. That is the reason that, that a person who's under the ruler is to obey and to submit. That the ruler may do it with joy. You sure take the joy out of the job when the people that you're teaching aren't obeying what you're saying and aren't submitting themselves to the word of God that you're teaching. And uh, when, you, when, when the teacher is teaching people who will not obey, will not to submit to the teaching of God's word, <laughs> the joy's gone. <laughs> I mean, there's no joy there. He still has a responsibility to teach, but that's saying obey and submit, and then it talks about him giving account that they may, that is the teacher, may do it with joy. That is to rule and to teach and watch over your souls. If you do your part, he can do it with joy and, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, I'd like you to tell me what way, now we're not Hebrew people, but were people who still have elders and who have the oversight and responsibility of teaching. And uh, it's still true that when the people you teach uh, submit to the teaching that you're giving them, uh, that it is a joy for the teacher and not a grief. But then the last part of verse 17 says, for that is unprofitable for you. It's unprofitable for you if they do it with grief. Is that what it means? And if, if that's what it means, why would that be unprofitable for you? No, no, it's not unprofitable for the teacher. It's unprofitable for the student. Well, the teacher's got his responsibility before God. He'll profit before God or not. But the, it's, it's unprofitable for the student if he's got to teach in grief. Why? Okay. Okay, but how is it that it's going to be unprofitable for the teacher for them to teach? Yeah. Okay. But Yeah, it's not just not paying attention. It has to do with obedience to what's being taught. Um, what I what I was thinking about is when Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And he warned them. He wrote 1 Corinthians, and they didn't respond. And he wrote 2 Corinthians. And he says, for your good, I didn't show up. Because if I had showed up, <laughs> I would have had to put you straight. <laughs> Can you add? Remember, the word of God is for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Who likes reproof? If people aren't learning, then the teacher's responsibility is to reprove those people. And, and, and Paul, not, now see, here's what, I, the reason I asked you the question, uh, I can dig it out in, in 2 Corinthians 10 if I look, take the time to do this. But what Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, not only did he warn them that I, 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 I've not come as soon as I plan to come for your sakes. And, and now I'm giving you extra time to, to get some things right so that when I come it can be a joyful time. But then he warns those who are still going to be, be, be disobedient and standing against his teaching, that when he comes, he's going to show them what kind of power he has in the Lord. Now, I, I, I'm talking about the Apostle Paul, 
And the power that he had in the Lord in Corinthians was a supernatural power. He said, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. And if there's people that are going to stand up against his word, he's not just going to verbally scold them. He was going to demonstrate it with some miraculous power. I think of those who stood up against Peter and, and the apostles in early Acts and tried to lie and say they were given part of the portion of their, uh, the good, of their land to, to the, the money that they got from selling of their land. They said they're giving it all to the apostles. And he said, you sure you're giving it all? Oh yeah, that's right. Boom, they dropped dead. <laughs> well, that's not profitable for them, you know? <laughs> There's someone who's disobedient to the teaching of the apostles. And, uh, now I don't think anybody has that kind of authority. But there is discipline, uh, discipline actions that's required uh, by those who rule over and watch over the souls. And, uh, and, and so in, in Hebrews, that's the idea of that, is it's more profitable to sit under a teacher and learn and become obedient and submit so that there's a growth in the assembly. To rebel against that teacher, the teacher's going to have to deal with that. And that's not, it, in one sense, I want to say it's not profitable, but it, there is a profit because the teacher's dealing with you. But it's not the kind of prophet that's, uh, uh, that's taking you better. It's one that's stopping you from going any worse. Uh, it's not improving your life because you're not in obedience. It's one that's correcting your life uh, because of disobedience. So there's a warning there about submitting to those rulers. Um, now let me ask you one more question before we go on because you'll probably like what we're going to go on to. And uh, look at verse 7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow concerning the end of their conversation. Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that, that must give an account, that they may do it with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Verse 24. Salute all them that have rule over you, and uh, all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. Is this writer one of the rulers? Look at those verses again. Maybe I should ask you the question before I read them. Is the writer of Hebrews one of the rulers he's talking about? Anybody venture an opinion? No one's going to venture opinion or no, he's not. <laughs> he, okay, that's... Okay, I, I got that too. Um, that he keeps talking about them as if them are over here and he's somewhere else, that he is not one of them, uh, except you have this. Look at verse 22. Um, it says in verse 22, I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written unto you a letter, I have written a letter unto you in few words. So he is telling them to, you better obey what I said here, or not better, but... Uh, he has written unto them something to obey. Uh, so it's not like the writing of Hebrews isn't for the Hebrews. It sure is. Uh, but at the same time, he doesn't seem to be including himself as, the, as, as part of that group who's watching over them and giving them that. Uh, so put that on the back burner of your mind. And now look at verse 18. And, and from 18 to 25, this is the conclusion of the book and the benediction says in verse 18, pray for us. For we trust we have a good uh, conscience in all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So you come into the conclusion there. Now, when you read verse 18, it's very obvious that the people, the Hebrew people who received this letter, they absolutely know who wrote the book of Hebrews, don't they? All we got to do is dig them up and raise them from the dead and ask them. Because <laughs> that's really a question. We started out the book of Hebrews, and, and the big number one question whenever you talk to grace people about the book of Hebrews is who wrote Hebrews? And I told you at the beginning that we're not going to deal with that at the beginning. We'll deal with it at the end. And it's at the end where you start give, getting some clues here of who might have wrote the book. And, uh, and certainly when it says pray for us, 
for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly, uh, that if he's asking people to pray for him, these people know who to pray for, don't they? So, uh, so it, it is, uh, the, the writer is known to the readers. Now, before I go too far, come back to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. And you know, Pastor Jordan always said that, uh, that the writer of the book of Hebrews was God. And, uh, and, you know, I thought, well, that's kind of a cop-out, but it's kind of a clever little thing to get you off the hook. Uh, but, you know, every, you know, like every time Paul wrote in his epistles, he always starts, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, unto, and then he names the people he writes to. He always starts out, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, every one of his books. He identifies himself. Uh, I imagine Peter does the same. Yeah, James chapter 1, James, a servant of God. Uh, Peter chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. The way we write a letter is we say, dear so-and-so, we write a whole bunch of stuff, and then we sign our name at the end. And so if someone didn't know who the letter was from, from the return address on the envelope, they have to read the whole letter or jump to the bottom to find out who the writer is, the way we write letters. In the Bible, the person identifies himself immediately. Well, when you come to the book of Hebrews, it's different. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the prophets, uh, uh, unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So I thought, God. And so Pastor Jordan always says, you know, well, God wrote the book of Hebrews. And certainly, God inspired the writing of the book of Hebrews. It is a letter from God. But there's more to that than just a, well, you know, the writer of Hebrews is, you know, is God. Look, look again at chapter uh, 12 of Hebrews. In, oh, wait a minute, chapter 2 first. Chapter 2, in verse 1. It says, Therefore we ought to give the most earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? In verse 1, Therefore, we ought to give the most earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Who is he talking about hearing? The Lord. He's saying, this writer is talking as if God has spoken in these last days. He's spoken to us by his Son. Therefore, you better watch out. You better listen to what his Son had to say. As if this letter is a last warning from Jesus Christ to the Hebrew people. Now come to chapter 12. This, it never lets up in the book. Verse 25, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Who's speaking now from heaven? In these last days, God spoke to us by his Son. And when you read verse 25, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. The writer of Hebrews is expecting these Hebrew people to look at this book as if this is God speaking. You better not dare go against anything that's written in this book because this book is written by God to you, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God to you. You see that in that? So it's not just a clever little thing and say Hebrews is really written by God, that's why the author's uh, not written here. Uh, that's not just a clever little thing. That is the theme of Hebrews. The, the author is backing off. The human writer is backing off so that the Hebrew people will say, listen, I, re I refused to hear Jesus Christ when he walked on earth. Now he's ascended back in heaven. He's talking to me one more time. I better listen to him this time. So you are to look at Hebrews as if this is Jesus Christ writing the letter directly. That's why the name in the writer does not show up in Hebrews. Because forget who he is. It doesn't matter who he is. It's Jesus Christ speaking for the last time to the Jewish people. And they better listen. Because if they don't now, they're in big trouble. So that is the whole gist of the book of Hebrews. So the human author, for us to tamper with that and to try to press for it, is, is, is frankly unprofitable. And would take glory away from Jesus Christ. He is the author of the book. Now, with that, we, we'll, we'll entertain some thoughts, but it's really irrelative. 
you know, the, the most important thing to know is that this is Jesus Christ speaking about the kingdom program to the nation of Israel. I returned Stam's commentaries on the book of Hebrews because he didn't acknowledge that. And I wrote him a letter and said, I can't sell this book at church here because it takes away everything you wrote and every other book you wrote. And, uh, and, and hopefully Pastor Sadler will soon change his opinion too. We've been through the book. The salvation of this book is Jesus Christ coming back to set up a kingdom with the nation of Israel. It has nothing to do with God's purpose for the Gentiles. And, it, and if, hopefully you've been along with us long enough to realize these people can lose salvation and everything else because they've got to go through a tribulation before they're going to receive their salvation. Uh, certainly the salvation is through the blood of Christ, but it comes when Jesus Christ returns. Just like all the prophets said, that's when God will save Israel. Um, so, back to verse 18. You know what? It's 25 after. We can't finish today, can we? <laughs> I can't finish today. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm gonna. You're gonna be hanging here. Uh, let me just. I'll read this verse. Just tell you something to work on. Verse 18. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. Now, we'll, we'll deal with the rest of it next week, and we'll, we'll talk about who possibly could have written Hebrews, and it's only a guess. But notice verse 18, the plural. That's not a person, is it? It's pray for us, not pray for me. It's pray for us, for, and, and it's not, I trust I have a good conscience. Now, that, that should ring a bell in your mind, because... Someone uses that phrase quite often. I'll show you he's not the only one, though. But the point is, is pray for us. We trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. And uh, you start fooling around with some verses there, and, and we'll, we'll do some comparing of verses next week and actually have to close the book then. And, uh, and uh, do, I, I don't, boy, I wish... Wish I could finish just for the sake of what I said about Jesus Christ. That is that is important. Uh, I realized when I got to chapter 12 and saw that verse. Uh, what verse number was that? 25. Uh, I remember when I when I saw it there, I thought, Hey, this is this book's not playing any games. This is from Jesus Christ. It makes the author, the human author, uh, less important. And uh, if you're back next week, if there's anyone else, I hope uh, we can make that point clear before we play around and foolishly ask some questions about who else could have wrote Hebrews or what human author could have been uh, used by God to write this. Uh, let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for a perfect Bible. And Father, the more we read it, the more we understand that this book is indeed your word, written down, preserved for us. And as we might uh, understand and acknowledge that you've used men to write it, and certainly you have us to know who our apostle is and who rules over us so that we might know what our doctrine is and how we can walk pleasing to you. That, Father, that the men you used are only men. The words are the words of Jesus Christ to us. And certainly Hebrews through Philemon speak to us Gentiles. And, and Hebrews through Revelation addresses the future time in which you'll deal again with the nation of Israel. Help us to be assured of that so that we might study our Bible and show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We ask it in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.